Hello, Cal AB. Welcome back. Uh, going to be talking to you about two different things today um, for our uh, class on Monday or Tuesday. Uh, and so this section is a little weird, um, but uh, that's because there's some notation that we need to get uh, get figured out first. Uh, sigma notation, if you're familiar with it, then that part will go pretty quickly. Uh, if you've not seen it before, uh, it's not too hard, but I want to take a, take a minute to talk about sigma notation. And then we're going to talk about area. And I know you're like, well, area, that's not so hard. Like, well, yeah, but we're going to talk about it as a, in a more calculus sort of sense uh, because um, one of the big applications of our new procedure or process that we're learning here, anti-deriving or integrating, uh, has to do with area. And if you remember way back to the beginning of the year, we talked about different kinds of tech uh, activities that were either pre-calculus mathematics or calculus mathematics. And you might remember that area um, where the boundaries are not straight, but they're curvy. Um, that's what we're going to be uh, working towards. So uh, let's start off, though, by, by, by taking a, a quick look at sigma notation. And uh, so um, by that, I mean, um, oh, look, there's some stuff on integration right there. Um, the uh, capital Greek letter sigma. So uh, if you uh, uh, haven't studied any classical Greek, that's all right this is a capital sigma. And it really means sum. It's a summation uh, notation. Usually there's an index. Could be the letter I, could be the letter K, it doesn't really matter. And we'll have it start at a certain number. That's what's on the bottom. And it'll finish at another number, maybe N, okay? And what it literally means is, um, there's some formula here that tells you what the terms of this uh, series are going to be. And so whatever that formula is, the sigma just means to add them up. So you take A1, A2, A3, A4, dot, 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 all the way up to A sub N and add them together. And that is quite literally what this sigma notation means. Uh, so let's take an example. Here's a very easy example. From one to five of i. Uh, so literally all we're going to do is add up the integers from one to five. One plus two plus three plus four plus five. Okay, and you can see that that would be 15, All right? And that is really what sigma notation is all about. We use sigma notation in calculus for a couple of different things. So um, in, in Calc AB, what we're gonna use it for in a little while, something called a Riemann sum. Uh, and that's named after a French mathematician, uh, uh, Riemann, who uh, came along after uh, Newton, but, um, was interested in looking at uh, area in, in area under curved, curved lines. And so uh, he developed something called the Riemann sum and it uses the summation notation. It combines it with a limit. So it's a little bit, it's kind of a neat calculusy thing. Um, we won't spend a lot of time with it this year just due to the um, kind of, uh, condensed nature of the course this year, but uh, but it is an important idea in calculus. It's, it's kind of where um, something called the fundamental theorem of calculus comes from. So as you can imagine, it's a pretty big deal for us. Um, I won't belabor the point too much here on summation notation, other than to say um, it's, it's, a, it's an important piece of the puzzle. Uh, on page 254, page 254, Fifty-four, you will find a blue theorem 4.2 that has a couple of different summation formulas for you. And um, the uh, I won't put them all up here because you have your book, you can see them, um, but they become handy uh, when you're doing part of the work for uh, this assignment because uh, you'll be able to break down some of the sums that you're asked to find uh, using the formulas. So uh, I'll just write it up here. This is theorem 
And so using theorem 4.2, we can um, come up with uh, a way to do a summation like the following. Um, and this is the example right below that. I'm only going to do one of them in the interest of time. And I have I plus one over, uh, oh, that's right. This was N at the top. And so it was N squared. And so um, using the, um, using the formulas that you see up above. For example, since n is a constant, we can bring that outside of our summation. And now you just have i plus 1. And then using the properties for summations, I can split that into two different summations. And now you can see um, how we would do these. If you look at theorem 4.2, the sum from i equals 1 to n of i, right? Well, that's i times i plus, oh, hey, let's try and write that a little neater. There we go. i plus 1 over 2. And um, I didn't mean i. I'm sorry, guys. I'm at N. Oh, boy. I, I'd, I blame it on the fact I haven't had any coffee, but that'd be a lie. I've had two cups of coffee already today. And then um, this one here is just um, the constant 1 times N. That's uh, This is uh, theorem 4.2. This is number 1. And this is number two. So we'll use those. And then um, I would just, uh, you know, combine everything together here uh, into a nice um, condensed form. And you're going to see that this is n squared plus n. Oh, sorry, I forgot my one over n squared outside over two plus, you know, 2n over 2, like so. And so that's how we get to our n plus 3 over 2n. And now if n is 10, as it was uh, up here at the beginning, uh, you can see this is going to be 13 20ths. And that's how those formulas can help you out. Rather than write out all 10 terms, because um, I don't want to do that. <laughs> it's, it's a lot easier to simplify it down and come up with an equation for the summation. Uh, you know, obviously 10 terms wouldn't be, you know, prohibitive, just a pain. Uh, this problem actually asked you to then do n equals 100 and then equals 1,000. And I don't think we want to write out 1,000 terms of this summation. So, I mean, if you're a real glutton for punishment, you could. Okay, but not necessary. We can simply uh, simplify it that way. Okay, so that's the summation part of today. The other part of today is area. And I think we're all familiar with the concept of area. Um, so let's not worry about specifics of area too much. What I want to do is talk about, okay, so when we find the area under a curve, okay, so not a nice rectangle triangle, anything like that, but rather a curved function, how do we do that? Now, um, if this is my function f of x here, and I'm going from, you know, let's say 0 out to whatever, whatever this guy is out here, uh, we'll call it a for right now. Um, 
Okay, so what we could do if we had graph paper is graph it on graph paper, count of all the little boxes, right? And then start going, well, this is like a third of a box here, and that's like a third of a box there, and that's another third. So those will be gonna we could we could try doing that. Okay. Um, but that's probably not how we want to do it, right? Uh, we probably want something a little bit more formalized. And that's exactly what calculus is going to lead us to here in a minute. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide up my interval from 0 to A into subintervals. And I'm going to draw some rectangles. And I'm going to say, well, you know, if I use rectangles, then I could find the area of the rectangles pretty easily. And maybe that's pretty close. Now the question is, okay, if I make my rectangle here, how high should it be? Should I go till the right edge hits the curve? Or should I go till the left edge hits the curve? Right edge, left edge. Upper value, lower value, okay? Well, what do you think? Right edge? Okay. We'll start with the right edge one. Ooh, come on. Oh, no. Well, that's interesting. I don't know why it's doing that, but. Oh, that was so close. It's hard on this trackpad to get everything exactly bullseye on there, but there we go. And I'm going to do that for a couple more here. So let's uh, let's see here. This one here. This is so much easier on the board when it's live. And this one here. Oh, that one there is flat, right? Because this is this is where it crosses the x-axis. So. Hmm. And what we've actually just shown you is that um, in this particular instance, uh, the uh, what we would call the right hand sum, where the right side of each of the intervals, okay, um, uh, well, is that going to over or us underestimate? Clearly, it's going to under. If I add the the four rectangles, I know this fourth one's kind of kind of flat, so he's he's not going to add a lot to the party, is he? Uh, but you know, if we look at the areas here, area one, area two, area three, and this is area four down here. Um, if I add those four areas together, uh -huh, the sum. Of these areas. I would get an approximation for the area under f of x, between f of x and the x-axis. And um, it's underestimating it, right? So sometimes uh, this is going to be called the lower sum because it is uh, underestimating. All right. OK, fair enough. Um, what about the left side? What if I had used the left side of my regions to determine how tall my rectangles are? Uh, we need a different color. How about green? If I use the left side, well, look what happens to my bars if I use the left hand. Oh. Right? They, they all go over. Where's, okay, there it goes. I don't know what happened to the pen there. All the bars are going to overestimate. Hey, guess what? Number four gets to come to the party now. Yeah. He's not going to be zero anymore, is he? No, he's not. There we are. And so my left side sum, okay. The left hand side. Oops, <laughs> still have the tool there. 
left side, that's going to over approximate. We call that an upper sum. Um, and so you can see that, you know, depending on the kind of function you're dealing with, your left side and your right side um, could, could change how they either over or under approximate. Um, why did the uh, left sum over approximate and the right sum under approximate on this particular function that I drew? Well, it did so because the function is decreasing, right? You, if you're in your head, you could probably imagine um, don't worry, I'm going to draw it in a second. You won't have to imagine for long. What would happen if that function was increasing? It would swap, right? Of course it would. Um, and so let's, well, let's just, let's draw it out so you can see that um, if you're having trouble imagining it. You know, if, if, I, if I change to an increasing function, you know, here's f of x now. Oh. I have the line tool still, doggone it. Here's A this time, zero. I'm just gonna real quick sketch this. Look what happens if I draw my left hand rectangles now. They under approximate. And the right side are the over approximators. Look at that, they totally switched on us. Darn them. Well, that's what you have to be careful of here. You wanna talk about them in terms of upper and lower sums, uh, not necessarily left and right, um, but sometimes your instructions will say, you know, left-hand sum, right-hand sum, and then figure out which one is the upper and which one's the lower. Just check and see if the function increasing or decreasing on the interval. Now, if it's changing, increasing and decreasing in the interval, uh, well, then you've got your work cut out for you because you got to figure out which one has more over or under. But that's the um, that's the idea. So whether the rectangle is inscribed or circumscribed um, uh, will change, and whether you have an upper or lower sum. So. Uh, what eventually ends up happening here, uh, you may notice that I've used four rectangles here and it would be a pretty bad approximation, I agree. Um, well, how could we improve our approximation? Uh, if you're thinking, hey, there should be more rectangles, you're right, that would be a, one way to do it. Um, so the idea is, well, how many rectangles should we use uh, and that's where Riemann came in. And uh, we'll talk more about Riemann sums later. Um, but Riemann noticed that as well. And he was like, hmm, I think maybe, um, you know, four rectangles is not enough. Maybe I should try eight. Maybe I should try 16, 32. And eventually what, um, what we saw happen was that the upper and lower sums got closer together the more rectangles you used. In fact, um, there's a theorem here on page 259. I won't, uh, uh, it's uh, theorem 4.3, page 259, that shows you, you know what, if you keep letting there be more and more rectangles, that eventually, as the limit of the number of rectangles goes to infinity, the upper and lower sums converge to one single number. And uh, we get our theorem then for area, um, which is the limit as n approaches infinity or the sum from one to n of the area of those rectangles. It's 
So how do we find the area of those rectangles, right? Well, I want you to notice that, you know, area we know for a rectangle, area is just length times width, right? Well, each of these, you know, each of these rectangles is supposed to be equal width, right? Okay, so I started at zero and I went over some distance on the x-axis. I'll just call that delta x, right? Okay, and um, you know, let's let's just talk about you know each of these points here on the uh, on the graph. You know, how high up or what's the length of that rectangle? Well, depending on which side you're at, okay, it's true. It could be the left side for the left rectangle, the right side for the right for the right rectangle. Um, you know, it's just some function of x, right? It's whatever that new x is. So, for example, you know, this um, first rectangle here uh, has an area of either either f of zero or f of x plus delta x. Right, um, but it's it's f of some x, right? That's determined by i, right? Okay, like it's f of x plus one delta x. And how about this second rectangle here? I'm going to use a different color. So this second rectangle here, well. That's f of x plus two delta x is tall, right? Times delta x. Well, two delta x is that's x two. Okay. And then this third rectangle, uh, where can I write it? I'm kind of running out of room. I'll write it over here. Its area is f of x plus three delta x's times delta x. That's f of x three delta x. See if we if we designate each point along the x-axis x one x two x three, you can find them by just adding the the proper number of delta x's. And so what that does is it changes your you know it kind of formalizes our limit language here to say it's the limit as n approaches infinity of the sum i going from one to n f of x sub i delta x. And that's how we get the two sums to converge. Use infinitely many rectangles and the two upper and lower sums will converge uh, on the actual area even though it's curved um, on the actual area underneath the curve, uh, between the curve and the x-axis. So um, let's take a look at uh, one example here. And my example is um, f of x is going to be x cubed and between x equals zero and x equals one. Okay, and we wanna find the area between the curve and the x-axis. Okay, I'll draw a quick sketch just so we're all on, oops, all on the same page. And, um, you know, x cubed comes in, does something like this and goes like this. So from x equals zero to x equals one, we're talking about the area right here, okay? So what I know is that area will equal the limit as n approaches infinity 
the sum i goes from one to n. So f of x, right? Uh, is one over I'm sorry that's that's not that's not a one it's an I times the width of the rectangles. Okay, because if you go from zero to one and you chop that up into n parts, right? Each delta x, right? Find the distance and chop it up into n parts, right? From one to zero is one divided by n, so one over n. Okay. And so um, we can use our formulas okay so you can see how there's a one over n to the fourth in here right the sum of i cubed from one to n now uh, I have to flip back to um, the uh, formulas on the summation thing, which was back on 254, yeah, 254 to find I cubed. But you can, you can see um, that I cubed sum is N squared times N plus one squared over four. Okay. And then we'll just do a little bit of algebra there. Um, and uh, you're going to get uh, one fourth plus one over two n plus one over four n squared. Well, if n goes to infinity, what happens to these guys is they go to zero. We get one fourth. So the area under this curve from zero to one is equal to one fourth. All right. Now I went through that algebra pretty quickly. So if you need to go back and pause, that's what you should do. Um, but you want to square the binomial here, distribute the n squared, and then distribute this, this one over n to the fourth. And that's how we get the one quarter plus one over two n plus. 104 and squared. All right, guys. That is how you use the, uh, oh, <laughs> that is how you use the uh, um, formula for uh, area to come up with the uh, area under the curve. All right, guys. Well, there we go. That's how uh, summation notation works. Uh, that's how summation notation uh, helps us with the area question. And uh, we'll see later on how Riemann used that, um, that idea to develop uh, what's called a Riemann sum, which eventually became something known as a definite integral. And um, hopefully uh, this video helped, in, helped you with that. And I look forward to Ms. Hoagie's video for later in the week. All right. Thanks so much, everybody.